As we look at John 4, before we dive into the text, you know, there's, there's the difficulty uh, in teaching the Word of God is knowing what you're going to present because it's just so much stuff there. Uh, and so, for instance, so tomorrow evening when we start uh, the Torah teaching, well, what I really plan to do is every year, year after year, teach Genesis through Deuteronomy. And you may think, well, wouldn't you run out of material? And the answer is no, not even close, right? Not even close. And so when I look at John 4, there's a lot that I'm, I'm not going to give you, but it's so good, I, I don't want to not give it to you. So I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to tell you, okay? Um, before we actually dive in. Um, because when I plan out Mosaic and I plan it out like 180 classes, right? I have a narrative. I have a way I want it to go. I have recurring themes. Uh, hopefully you've, you've already started to see some of that coming to fruition, um, right? But that doesn't mean that's all there is. And sometimes it's the, the other stuff is, is so good. Um, I at least want to tell you a little bit about it. If anything, it piques your curiosity and you can Go in that direction in your own private study. So there's a part of the conversation between Jesus and this woman at the well that we really won't go into a whole lot of depth about, but I want to make sure you're aware of. When Jesus gets to that point where he says, you know, go um, tell your husband, and her response is, well, I have no husband, and Jesus then says, that's correct, um, you've had five husbands, right? And the one you're with now is not your husband. John is, Jesus there, um, John writing it, but Jesus is actually making actually a political point there, a very deep political point. Um, and he's referring there, the woman is representing God's people over time, right? This is Jesus coming to his people as the Messiah, so to speak. And when you look at the history of God's people, they've had five significant exiles, five significant times in their life where they were uprooted from their land because they chased after other gods or because they became enamored with things of the world and it caused them to leave their spouse, right? It caused them to leave their God, right? So you have these five exiles, which are Egypt, Babylon, uh, the Persian Medea, uh, empire. You have the Hellenistic or the Greek, and then you have Rome. And those are the five husbands that God's people have had before, right? And the one she's with now is the way of the, the way the, the current Samaritans were, were teaching and so forth that really isn't her husband. Uh, so I just want to throw that out there because that's, that's, that's an amazing an amazing kind of layer to the onion that's going on in this story, um, uh, especially when it invokes Jacob's well and Joseph and, and so forth. So that's what I'm not going to tell you about, all right, is that those five husbands relate to the five exiles of God's people because that in and of itself is its own, own, own long study. Uh, so with that of what you're not going to learn today, let's open up our text and look at John chapter 4, verse 10. Uh, again, we're in the middle of this conversation. Uh, Jesus is there. It's middle of the day. He's hot. He's thirsty. This woman's there alone. He asks for something to drink. Uh, and, of course, she's kind of shocked that he's speaking to her because, one, he's Jewish, she's Samaritan, two, because she's a woman and he's a male, right, breaking these social kind of taboos and barriers. And so in this conversation, we now read Jesus speaking back to her. So let's read together. Jesus answered and said to her, if you only knew the gift of God and who was saying to you, please give me a drink, for then you would have asked him and he would give you living water. <clears throat> so Jesus <clears throat> answers <clears throat> the woman uh, with a somewhat cryptic invitation. If she knew the one with whom she was speaking, she would have asked him for water, and he would have given her what in Hebrew is known as ma'im kaim, 
living water. On a very technical level, a very basic level, living water refers to natural flowing water, not water that's kind of like in a swamp or that is stagnant or that is just sitting in a bowl, but natural flowing water. Drawn water, cistern water, water manipulated through aqueducts or plumbing does not qualify as Ma'im Kaim, living water, from a first century perspective. Living water flows from springs, it runs in rivers, it collects in lakes and pools, it rains from heaven. In fact, in uh, those first five books of the Bible, it requires living water for all purification ceremonies. Anytime a priest would wash his hands or anytime there was some kind of immersion or mikvah in water, it had to be done with living, flowing water. But on a deeper level, because we're in the Gospel of John, right, and and John writes on that where it means what it says, it says what it means, but it also has an underpinning story going on. Uh, Jesus uses the term living water metaphorically to refer to the spiritual cleansing through his teaching and through his Holy Spirit. Uh, A similar passage says that we will get to eventually in John 7, that it says Jesus spoke of the spirit of whom those who believed in him were to receive. So we're only introducing living water, Ma'im Kaim, right now in Mosaic in John 4, because when we finally get to John 7, we have a major, major discourse on living water. And so I want you to be prepared for it. So you're kind of hearing about it now. Remember, I want you to have that first century Galilean disciple perspective. At this point in Jesus' ministry, his disciples are newbies, right? They don't know everything. They haven't heard everything. They haven't seen everything yet. They don't know the rest of the story. They got nothing to look back and retrospect about, right? And so they're kind of learning this as they go. I kind of want you to have that experience in Mosaic too. So I want you to hear about living water now. I want you to get some of its concepts now so that when we hit it in John 7, We're ready to go even deeper with it, okay? Uh, So right now, it's got a connection to spiritual cleansing. It's got a connection to Jesus' teaching. And living water, Ma'im Kaim, is always in the Bible connected with the movement of the Holy Spirit. So you can kind of think as the river runs and flows, right? That's the Spirit flowing uh, through you. In the first century world, the rabbis used living water metaphorically to talk about the Torah, the Bible, the teachings of Scripture, and the Holy Spirit. And so when Jesus is talking about that he can offer living water, he's actually offering uh, the woman both his teaching uh, as well as spiritual regeneration, right? He's offering her his teaching, which will lead to her transformation. It will lead to an inner transformation within her. And that's going to be a major point of John 4, that when Jesus goes to work on you, it doesn't just change your external circumstances. In fact, it, it may not change your external circumstances a whole lot. The woman still stays in Samaria. She still lives in that town after she's encountered Jesus. But it cha- Jesus changes you internally. He changes your spirit. He changes your demeanor. He changes your worldview. He changes your consciousness, right? Um, right? And so that's what he's offering her. Um, There's also some Old Testament connections. Everything Jesus says, everything Jesus teaches always has roots um, in the Old Testament. That's why we call him the Word made flesh. He is embodying the Word of God that has come before him. He is literally living out those words in flesh and blood. Uh, A couple of quick examples just from the book of Proverbs that shows you living water is connected with teaching uh, is um, Proverbs 13, verse 14. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life, right, of living water to turn aside from the snares of death, right? So whenever you encounter a wise teacher, and I think Jesus would classify as that, right, the teaching of a wise person, chokhmah, wisdom, It's living water. It's what enables us to live a way of true life and not a way of death. 
both, right? So in the Bible, there's, especially in Proverbs, there's all this discussion that there's two ways in life, the way of life and the way of death. And there, life and death aren't physical life and death, but rather it's kind of like you can go through life as almost a walking dead, dead inside, not connected to the Creator, not connected to anything holy, not connected to anything with purpose, not connected to anything with meaning, uh, not connected to an identity. That's the way of death. And the way of life is to have purpose, to have meaning, to have understanding, to be given wisdom, to know how to navigate life itself. And so living water is this teaching that enables you to do that according to the book of Proverbs. Or Proverbs 18, verse 4, the words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. Um, and as in a verbal sparring match, so the woman now is going to respond to Jesus. Uh, and at first, it sounds like she's responding to him at a literal level, kind of like that conversation with Nicodemus, which we found out they really weren't on a literal level. Um, and she points out to him that uh, he has nothing with which to draw water from the well. Uh, she absolutely understood that he was hinting towards something supernatural. Hence, she asks him this question. And let's read it together. John chapter 4, verse 12. This is the woman speaking back to Jesus. You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. All right. And so there... Jacob, of course, not only dug this well, which provided water physically for him and his cattle as recorded in the book of Genesis, uh, but Jacob is a patriarch. He is a spiritual father of God's people who also gave them drink, if you will. He gave them a living water. And so she knows he's hinting at something deeper. She knows living water is referencing, oh, you've got something to offer me. Well, you don't think, and because Samaritans and Jews both share Jacob in common, she's like, well, you, you don't think you're greater than Jacob, do you, right? Uh, that would be like someone in, say, the, the Lutheran tradition, right? A, a pastor gets up and he starts preaching and teaching and someone's like, well, you, you don't think you're, you're smarter or greater than Martin Luther, do you? You don't think you know more than John Calvin, do you, right? Uh, that's what she's invoking, like, okay, you're saying you can offer me something that I'm missing, something deep internally, right? Something in my soul, something in my heart, something that's uh, just this black hole in my life. You're claiming you can fill that, that you're teaching your wisdom, this spirit that you're going to give to me, it's going to, to satisfy me at a very deep, intimate level personal, emotional, psychological, relational level. Who do you think you are, right? Jacob, in the sense you're at Jacob's well, that's a, a perfect way to kind of respond to that. So Jesus comes back, and it's kind of his way of going, well, actually, yeah, I kind of do think I'm greater than Jacob, right? Um, but he, he does so in a way that's engaging the conversation, which also teaches us an important spiritual lesson. Right? We learned this uh, as before uh, um, with other people Jesus has encountered so far. You have to be willing to engage Jesus. Right? You have to be willing to stick in it with him. Right? Don't expect the snap of the finger. You've got to be willing to ask the questions. You've got to be willing to kind of spar back. You've got to be willing to, to struggle with it. And so she's engaging Jesus, right? And he is engaging her back. He is able to bring her along because she is allowing him to bring her along. So here is how Jesus responds to, is he greater than Jacob? Does he, does he possess something even more than a patriarch? Well, let's read his response beginning in verse 13. Jesus said, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, right? Uh, and so uh, she responds sarcastically, I think, anyways, but also seriously. It's, again, she's engaging Jesus. You have to be willing to where, where Jesus takes you, 
where you find yourself in life, those with whom Jesus is allowing to interact with you in life, where you find yourself in your job or your vocation or your school or in your relationships, you, you've got to be willing to wrestle with it and, and go along with it, uh, which is why, again, they're at Jacob's well. What is one of the things Jacob is well known for? wrestling with God, right? That's how he moves from Jacob to Israel. That's not just a name change. It means he becomes a different person, right? He becomes the one uh, who takes to the one who is with God, the one who struggles with God and wins, the one who goes uh, Israel. Uh, that name means several things in Hebrew. One of them is Yashael, which means straight to God, right? How did he get that direct route to God? By being willing to to wrestle with God. And so you kind of have reminiscent of uh, the woman in that role now wrestling with Jesus. But I think sarcastically, she kind of responds this way in verse 15. Let's read it together. Master, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw, right? I hear a little bit of sarcasm in that, but I also hear like the challenge, the test, okay? All right, you've got my attention, stranger, this strange Jewish man coming from Jerusalem, going back to the Galilee. You've piqued my interest. Um, you're saying things in such a way that I'm, I'm, I'm buying some sincerity. I'm seeing in your eyes you're not just a normal, normal individual kind of spouting things. If that's the case, then do it, right? Let's see it. Let's see it. So... Jesus then raises the stakes of the conversation. This is where he tells her to go and call her husband and uh, astounds her by knowing her life story. This is one of the things, if you've been watching The Chosen during our, our sermon series on that, I think they do a really good job about how Jesus throws that in, like when he knows your name even though you've never met before and the person's like, how in the world does he know my name? Or when he gives details that they know. There's no way he can know those details, right? And he does it in such a way that it strikes them in their core. It strikes them in their spirit, and they realize there's something going on here. And so his kind of revealing her personal life, right, reveals that he does have at least, at the very least, prophetic insight, that he is at the very least a prophet. She's a, now picking up on that, that at the very least, he's a prophet because he, he knows things that only a prophet would know, and he's saying things that only uh, a prophet would say. So with only a few words, Jesus bears her soul, and in so doing, he also reveals her true need, her true need for teaching, correct teaching, and repentance, and spiritual regeneration. Her cynicism at this point vanishes. And so she declares, Master, I perceive that you are a prophet, right? She perceives he's a prophet. Now, with that, she then decides, well, if I got a prophet on my hand, right? It's one of those things you may have heard people say, you know, when I die, it's going to be the first thing I ask the Lord, right? Some, some mystery or whatever. That's going to be one of the things I ask the Lord about, right? You've probably heard that phrase, maybe said that phrase. Well, apparently, this is what she thinks like as well. So she's like, oh, I've got a prophet. Well, us Samaritans have wondered about this question forever, and it's always the first question we want to ask God when we get to heaven, right? So here's her question to see. Well, let's see what kind of prophet you are. Let's read chapter 4, verse 20 together. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say Jerusalem is the chosen place to worship, right? And by this mountain, she means Mount Gerizim in Samaria. Uh, Gerizim is still the mountain that the Samaritans worship at where they celebrate Passover and the festivals of the Bible. They still do it at Mount Gerizim. Uh, and she says, but, but you, you Jewish people say, well, it's Jerusalem, right? It's Mount Moriah. That's where the Temple Mount is uh, in Jerusalem. We say it's Gerizim. You say it's Moriah. Well, which is the correct place? 
because after all, I've, I've got this prophet now. He's going to let me know. And I think this is one of those very significant spiritual lessons as well for us. And that is, Jesus will answer her question. He will, and he'll, he'll answer it very matter-of-factly. But he also lets her know that that's not really that important of a question, that it isn't, it isn't as uh, perplexing and uh, end-all, be-all as she's made it out to be or as everybody's made it out to be. And I think sometimes that's a lesson for us as well. Sometimes we can become incredibly focused on finding out one thing or figuring out one thing or understanding the reason for this one thing. And we, we, just, we just are convinced that if we just knew this one thing, if this one thing were revealed to us, if this one thing happened, right, everything would just make sense. And then that becomes our focus and it sidetracks us from actually spiritually maturing. It sidetracks us from truly getting to know Jesus and, and moving on to even better questions, if you will, which it becomes a process. And so a lot of times that's a very first century Galilean teacher way to go. And if you've encountered me enough outside of being up here and you've asked me questions, you've probably found that's how I will answer your question as well. Because while I appreciate the question, I love, I love with all my heart, nothing makes a pastor's heart burst than to know people are, are listening and in the word of God and having questions. I also hear in that question, oh, yeah. You're going to have a better question if you just hang in there for six more. In six more weeks, you won't even care about that question. You'll know the answer to it, but you won't even care about it anymore. And no matter how big and how much you've thought about it, oh, man, I can tell you're on the right track. Oh, if you just hang in there six more weeks, you're going to have a better question, and you're going to have better understanding. And then you ask me that question in six weeks, and I'm going to go, oh, yeah, and I'm going to put you off. Because I know in just six more weeks, you're going to not even care about that question. Because you'll have the answer. It'll come to you naturally. You're going to have a better question. Right? That's where Jesus is going with her. It is such a masterful uh, display of how a rabbi brings along a disciple in the first century. right? And it really should be a model for how we bring along people uh, today. So she, she has this, what she thinks is just piercing question. And again, Jesus appreciates the question. He really does. And he does answer it. But he moves her past it. All right? So the verbal bat battle is continuing, realizing she's in the presence of a real prophet uh, uh, who happened to be Jewish while she's Samaritan and places her in an awkward position. So her mind naturally goes to the religious controversy between her people and his people, the, what seems to have defined them, right? This one issue seems to have defined both of these people and has prevented them from loving one another as themselves, right? It's, it's a, a huge gap. Uh, and so she's really asking, well, you know, what's the deal with this? Uh, who are uh, the ones who have the promises from God? Which mountain did all of this come from? Uh, she asked all of those questions by simply, again, stating in verse 20, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. You people say that in Jerusalem, that's the place that men ought to worship. Um, Jesus does answer, and he, he comes down pretty solidly on the Jewish side. Verse 22, uh, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. He answers her question, right? He answers her question really matter-of-factly. Like, there is no wiggle room in that answer. There's no uh, marshmallow and fluff in that answer. She gets her answer. But Jesus doesn't stay there because that isn't the issue for Jesus. And he knows it isn't the issue for her either. And he knows it has the potential to stump her, to stall her. Like we so often get stuck uh, ourselves and things we think are so important. So Jesus wants to move beyond this. Uh, though he certainly answers her question, he also quickly dismisses the question of the correct place to worship by pointing to a better question. All right, that's what a rabbi does. 
He points her to a better question, a better issue, something much more important, and something that is internal and spiritual, right? He wants her to think about, not about the physical location of where worship is. There is an answer for it. Jesus gives you the answer for it. But he's like, there's something more important. And if you get that, that question will already be answered for you, and you won't be, you won't be befuddled by it, okay? So Jesus then tells her, he, he uh, says, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father, right? So he's, he's wanting her to know there, there's a, a prophecy of Jesus, so he is in the role of a prophet. He's predicting the future destruction of the temple. He's predicting the future destruction of Jerusalem that would happen about 40 years after this because he's saying, look, there's going to come a point in time where ain't nobody worshiping on either one of these mountains because they're going to be destroyed by the Romans. And then what you going to do? What are you going to do then when there is no temple on Moriah and you cannot, the, the Romans won't let you worship on Gerizim? What are you going to do when Gerizim and Moriah both are out of the equation? Because he says, I tell you the truth, a time is coming when that will be the case. And history proved him correct. There came a time when that was the case. The better question is, what's going on inside of you in worship? Same kind of question for us. We can get so fixated on the song choices, the tempo, how loud it is, how quiet it is, how many people are singing, who's singing it, what we're singing it, and so forth and so on, that guess what? Whenever you're obsessed with that, here's the one thing you are not doing. You are not worshiping. You're so fixated on the external of it that nothing is going to change you internally, right? And that's where he's wanting to move her. So let's keep reading uh, the text here, verses 23 and 24. Let's read together. This is Jesus' response. However, an hour will come and is even now when true servants of God will worship the Father with spirit and with truth. For the Father desires worshipers like these. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship with spirit and with truth. All right? So if you're worshiping with spirit and truth, you can worship in spirit and truth with how great thou art to uh, a kid's little tiny little organ with 12 keys, or you can do so to a uh, hill song with a 20-piece rock band, right? If you're worshiping in spirit and truth, you are connecting to something that's beyond the physicality and the externals. Not that, none, that those things aren't important. Those things are important, and they need to be done well. They need to be thought out. They need to be theological, and they need to be all of those things. But don't get stuck there. Don't get stuck there, because if you do, right, you're going to be like this Samaritan woman. Jesus is wanting to bring you past this. And we need to pay attention to what he's saying in there because it's a, a phraseology I want to talk about. Sometimes Jesus will say, an hour will come. And then he will say, an hour will come and is even now. Right? That's prophet speak. All right? So I want to kind of unpack that. Jesus used two similar phrases to prophetically predict things that would happen in the future. When you're reading through the Gospels, sometimes Jesus will say, an hour is coming period. An hour is coming, and then he says it. Other times, he will say a similar phrase, but different. An hour is coming and is now, or now is. What is the difference between these two phrases? When Jesus said an hour is coming, he's referring to an event that's going to happen in the future, at least from their perspective at that point, right? An hour is coming, right? In the future, this temple in Jerusalem will be laid to waste, right? And it will be difficult to worship on Gerizim or Moriah. That's in the future. An hour is coming. But when he says, and now is, he's referring to a prophetic event that will happen in the future, but is already in motion now, and in many ways, at the very least, is partially attainable, if not from a spiritual perspective, fully attainable, kind of like the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. Well, is the kingdom of God something in the future that's going to come when Messiah returns, or is the kingdom of God right here and right now? 
Yes, an hour is coming, right? There will be an ushering in of the kingdom. But the time is also now where at least from an internal spiritual perspective and even somewhat externally, we can already begin to access those attributes and concepts and kingdom um, realities now. So Jesus is predicting in the future a destruction of the temple. That's an hour is coming. That's when people aren't going to be on Gerizim. They aren't going to be on Moriah. Uh, uh, that's in the future. But then he says an hour is coming and now is, meaning that's already being set in motion. That's already being set in motion. With Jesus' arrival and with his teaching, what is already being set in motion is for people to be able to approach the Father and to worship in purity and spirit and truth without having to be in a specific physical location. In other words, he, we saw it in John 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, right? Uh, that language, uh, mishkan, it's the same word for the tabernacle. Jesus is already kind of becoming this locus, this, ev- this, this entity in which the Father is approached and worshipped. And so Jesus is now saying, look, what once everyone understood connected to either one of these mountains, whichever line you're falling on, Samaritan or, or, or Jewish side, right? That reality that they were pursuing, that spirit, that truth, the core of it, the real reason that they should have been there, well, an hour is coming, right? Well, they won't be doing that on those physical locations. But it's even now, i.e., I am in front of you, right? I am the way to have this connection. I am the tabernacle among you. I am the holy place. He is becoming this repository for the way to access the Father. All right? That's what he is opening her up to, right? And how much bigger is that than her original question of which physical location, right? And he's like, oh, I'm glad you're thinking that. You're on the right track. You're beginning to think, how do I worship? How should I worship? What does worship look like? What am I supposed to be doing when I worship? And he's saying, look, you're going to find that in me. You're going to find that in me, not a physical location, because there's going to come a point where those are not available to you. And so God desires that we will worship him in both spirit and truth. The question is not one of being Jewish or Samaritan, nor is it of worshiping in Jerusalem or Gerizim. The important matter concerns the attitude, the disposition, the vessel that is the heart. The individual worshiper and their heart as it is disposed to the revelation of God when it is given. To worship God in spirit is to worship him as one spiritually reborn. Born from above, born again, that conversation with Nicodemus. That's what it means to worship God in spirit, to worship him as born again. To worship God in truth is to worship in accordance to the truth of his revelation, the word of God. All right? So uh, here the Samaritans are, are, are failing in this, right? This is for her, the husband that is not her husband. Right? That's what he means by that, in that conversation with her. And that's why he tells the woman, you worship what you do not know. He can sense her heart's in the right place, and so he's just guiding it. He's pointing it to the better issue, to the better question. He told her an hour is coming, the messianic age, when all humanity will worship the Lord in spirit and truth, because the Lord will pour out his spirit on all flesh. All will know him, right? That's the promise from Jeremiah the promise of the new covenant. But when he says the time is now, he's letting you know that that already is in motion and is ready for you to start taking part in. So let's keep reading the text. So she hears this, it floors her. So she responds, let's read together. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah will come, who is called Christ, He will come and tell us everything. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Jesus did not give the woman 
the answer she wanted to hear. So when you ask me questions, a lot of times I hope I don't give you the answer you want to hear. And when you have that experience with me, know it's by design, okay? It's just like this. This is how disciples are made. She hoped to end the conversation by simply saying, well, I know Messiah's coming. We both have that in common again. And when he comes, he'll sort everything out, right? She's hoping maybe this, get her out of this conversation a little bit. Uh, in other words, hey, this is intriguing. You've piqued my interest. I know you're a prophet. Just going to have to wait for Messiah, right? And then Jesus drops the bomb on her. It's important to note, though, this is big, right, when you're reading through the Gospels. In this early juncture in Jesus' ministry, early on, when Jesus is among his own people in Judea or in the Galilee, when Jesus is among Jewish people, Early in his ministry, he exercises great reticence about messianic claims, right? He tells people don't say anything. He tells people be quiet. Don't tell them about the miracle. People confess belief in him. He's like, you just keep that on the down low, right? Uh, John 2, the, the miracle at Cana, my time has not yet come, right? He keeps it. He's very reticent early on when he's amongst his people. But here, when he's in Samaria, man, like, he doesn't mess around, right? It's, it's buh. It's right in your face. Um, in Samaria, no qualms about declaring his identity. Uh, in a deliberately inverted syntax, right, in the Greek of this, it is so jacked up. It's the worst Greek sentence known to mankind, and it's on purpose, because it's emphasizing exactly what he's saying, that I am he, right? And this is in John's gospel. John likes Jesus using I am statements. And on your handout, you'll see that <clears throat> there are those I am statements of the gospel of John. I'm introducing you to them now, right? Because you're early, you're following Jesus, you're just not getting to know him. As we continue to encounter them, we will continue to further explore them, right? So we're not exhausting them today. We're pointing them out today because our first one we've encountered. But we're newbie disciples. We're still figuring Jesus out. So this one probably fell on deaf ears, right? Or it maybe was like, hmm, that's kind of odd to catch that, but move on, right? But as the gospel progresses, it becomes harder and harder to be like, that was kind of weird, or he kind of spoke that. Did you catch that? Is, is he saying what I think he's saying, right? It gets harder and harder to dismiss it. So I want you to know they're coming. This is the first one in John's gospel. And so I'll list them there for you. There is, I am he, meaning the Messiah here in John 4. Then in John 6, multiple times in that discourse, he says, I am the bread of life. Uh, John 8, uh, multiple times, I am the light of the world. Uh, in John chapter 9 as well. Uh, then you have in John 8, which is my personal favorite one, uh, because the grammar is so jacked up. Before Abraham, not I was, not I existed then. Before Abraham, I am. Before Abraham, before 3,000 years ago, I'm in the present tense, right? Stick that one. That's a shift because that's where you're, the disciples are going to be like, oh, yeah, he, he, he's actually meaning what we, we kind of thought he was meaning and that we were not wanting to deal with. He's kind of meaning that now, right? Then it goes on in John 10, I am the gate. Um, I am the good shepherd. 14, a very famous one. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Uh, chapter 15, I am the true vine. And then again, toward the end of the gospel, I am he. Notice those bookends I tell you about. Gospel writers love bookends. John has an I am he at the beginning, and he has an I am he at the end. All right? Nice bookend. So those are these I am, I am statements in John's gospel. Be aware of them. Be alert with them. Be in the state of an early disciple just now getting to know Jesus going... What is he getting at with that? Okay. Let's keep reading in the text. John chapter 4, verse 27. While he was speaking like this, his disciples came and were amazed that he was speaking with a woman. 
But no one said to him, what did you ask or what did you speak about with her? So notice at this juncture, the woman is more of a disciple than they are because she had no qualms about asking questions. And questions are good. Just don't always expect your question to get answered the way you want it answered, right? But she asks her questions, and she engages Jesus, and Jesus engages her. And as a result, she's brought along. His disciples at this point, again, they see it, they feel it, they recognize it, they're probably talking to each other about it, but they're not ready to ask him, right? They're not yet ready to engage. And about this point in the conversation with the woman, the disciple has returned with food and provision and arm. They're startled, of course, to see Jesus alone with a woman, a Samaritan, in deep conversation. But they presume not to question their master about it at this time. Probably out of respect, right? That's some, some of what you do as a disciple. Uh, and then she's left to report this encounter back to her village, and she spreads the word around, right? So she goes and tells, right? She's been sent forth. Um, they offer Jesus food and they urge him, Rabbi, eat. But he replies in verse 32, I, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And he explains, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Now, I don't know about you, but me, I'm like, oh boy, first the water, and now the food. Somebody asks you for water and you go into this crazy diet drive about living water. Now someone asks you for food and you're talking about you don't got food that they need and you got food that they should be eating. Like, what is going on? Can this guy not have a straight conversation? Right? No, he can't. Jesus never has a straight conversation. Rabbis never have straight conversations with their disciples. They're always speaking in codes and riddles and parables and metaphors and double entendres. Always, 24-7. Oh, it's so fun. It's so fun, right? So first, give me a drink. Oh, I've got living water. Give us some food. Oh, I've got some food for you, right? So as we've learned when we studied the temptation of Jesus, the Son of Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Nourishment is God's word. It's obedience to the Father's will. The revelation of the Father's will is the word of God. That's what proceeds from his mouth. And Jesus says that's where he finds his nourishment, service to his Father. So in this passage in John 4, Jesus employs both water and food as metaphors for deep spiritual truths. All right? The Samaritan woman had... Uh, misunderstandings about reality and truth and worship and faith. The disciples also had aspects of their walk with God that needed some tweaking. So let's boil it all down here as we close. Water and food, those are the most basic of all human needs, right? Jesus uses them respectively to speak of our need for him, for salvation, for spiritual cleansing, for obedience to God. The one follows the other, and both are necessary for survival and life. So living water. What is living water? It's consciousness. It's Christ consciousness. It's awareness. It's to be awoken. It's a clarity of identity and purpose. It is revelation, spiritual revelation, and it is the regeneration in the Holy Spirit. It is salvation in its broadest scope. And food, what is food? It's doing the will of God. It's obedience to that which flows from one's faith and a deep connection to the word of God. It's living out the word of God. That's living water. That's food. 